All right, final review of the year, multiple choice part. Again, multiple choice. There will actually be choices on your test when we get there, unlike this, but we'll use our brains a little bit today. Okay, domain and range of the following function. We've said this a few times here in the last week. When we're looking at growth and decay functions, my domain never changes, ever. Never, never, ever, never, ever. Even if there's a number out here, doesn't matter. Even if this is a fraction, doesn't matter. Negative infinity to infinity. My range is always going to be zero to infinity unless there's a value at the end. Unless there's a plus or a minus value here at the end and then this changes with it. So just kind of as an FYI, let's say for example, instead of this, it, it had a slight change. It was like this, my range would be negative four to infinity, okay? So range is always zero unless there's an up or down shift at the very end and then it moves with it. Could I look at the calculator? Sure. Could I type this in and look at the picture? Absolutely. I'm just not going to here. Give an example of a function that represents exponential decay or growth. It's all about the number in the parentheses. If it's decay, it needs to be a value between, oops, I got a little ahead of myself, between 0 and 1. In other words, it's going to be a fraction in there. If the x value is greater than 1, that would be growth. And I don't have to get fancy and put pluses and minuses and all that other stuff. Just something basic and simple like this would tell me. But that's what I really need to remember here. Less than one, decay. Greater than one, growth, basically, is what we're going to be doing there. Uh, deposit into an account. Yeah, paying 5% annual interest compounded continuously. Yes, the formula will be there. The only thing people have got to watch for on a problem like this is that E is an actual value. I'm not substituting in for it, and we'll get that button press here again in a minute. My rate has to be a decimal, and I'm actually given the time. So I can literally, once I get that ready, go to my calculator and type it in, it's second and ln, second and natural log down the side here. We'll even get that on here. Second ln, along that left edge to get E, and then notice it goes to an exponent, so now I just type in what I had for mine. Hit enter. and I'll have my balance after 20 years. So just got to remember my butt presses a little bit on that one. All right, tourism, same idea. Hotel room increasing in price. Here's the original price. How much will it cost now? Again, got the equation. A is my starting value, 58 bucks. 1 plus, again, with rate, if you're not sure how to go to a decimal, just take that 6.1 and divide it by 100. And here, unlike the last review that we were doing, we're not wanting the expression. We actually want to put a number in for t. So let's look at this. We started in 1980. It's now 2017. So I need to know how many years have elapsed. So if I do, without blinding everybody here, if I do 2017 minus 1980, it's been 37 years. That's going to be my time. And now I can just literally punch that into my calculator. And that's going to tell me what 
Oofda. Now that's a pricey hotel room. $518.68. That's craziness for a place to sleep. And get my answer. So I'm like, okay. Kind of see how this goes. So, all right, let's see what else we got. What's the solution? Okay. Reminder here, before some of you think you're getting cute and you go and exponentiate, I don't need to. Look at X is already on a side by itself. I need to get this typed into my calculator. That little thing called change of base, the physically bigger number, we take the log of it, divided by the log of my base. There are a couple of other ways I could go, but they're a lot longer, and we don't want to deal with long stuff. That's kind of silly. Because basically all you're asking yourself is 3 to what power equals 243? I could mess with that on my calculator, but again, who wants to take all that time? Rewrite as an exponential function. Oh boy. Here's what I got to remember. That little 2 is my base, so that's my big number. The number on the other side of the equals is always my exponent. And whatever is next to the log is always going to be my answer. Nothing to solve. You don't have to solve it. Just rewrite it. And it'll always be in that format. The little number is the base equals part is the exponent and whatever's with my log is going to be my answer. Inverse, done it a bunch. Switch X and Y and we're going to be solving for Y. I cannot divide by 4 so how am I going to get the 4 out of there? What have we just been doing in the last two problems? You use the log of that base to get that 4 out of there, which gets me to y, which is what I want. And then I just write what's left over. And that's all I can do for the inverse, because now y is by itself. And once y is by itself, we've actually found the inverse once we switch x and y. So nothing too bad so far. But a lot of it should look familiar because we've done a lot of it. All right. Solve. Okay, whenever we're solving, whichever term has x has to be isolated first. So I've got to get the 9 out of there first. And now... I need to do the inverse of E. Now, we haven't talked about that quite as much in the last few days. The inverse of E is natural log, or ln. It's that button that's about two-thirds of the way down on the left. Because ln and E are inverses, so they zap out. And then I just type in the rest of it, the natural log of 193 and get this little funky answer, this 5.26. Get that solution. So again, not bad. Expand. Oh boy, that's where I gotta remember all my opposites. So let's kind of think about this again for a minute. Multiplication becomes addition, but you're like, wait a minute, wasn't there something before that when we were expanding? We'll get there, but not yet. So log x squared plus, because that's like my little multiplication dot, log y cubed. What did divide mean again? It meant subtract. So minus log of z, those are my first steps. Multiply becomes add, divide becomes subtract. And then when we're expanding, the exponents become coefficients.
And once we've taken care of that part, we're done. But I gotta keep that straight. And if I can keep that straight, it's gonna make number 10 that much easier because everything I just did, now I'm gonna do the opposite of. So you're like, okay, well if I'm doing the opposite, here we went exponent to coefficient last. So now we're gonna go coefficient to exponent first because we're doing everything in reverse. So once I get those flipped, my last job, we get it down to one log, remember, and right now we have two. So the only thing left I notice I can do is, hey, subtract. Subtract turns back into divide. So x to the seventh and y to the fifth. But whenever we condense, one log and one log only. If there'd have been a plus, we'd have multiplied them together instead. But otherwise, one direction back to the other. My minus didn't show up too good, did it? Okay. And then 11 should be an easy one. If you see the same natural log or the same log on each side, we just use the inverse to dump them, which in this case, E and natural log are opposites, the same <laughs> as they were in number eight. And then it just becomes a regular old algebra one problem where I go ahead and I get all my x's to one side. Then I work on isolating it. And get my x. But again, it's just those little things like knowing that e and natural log are opposites that are gonna make all the difference. Let's see what else we got lined up here. Deposit our birthday money into an account that earns 3.5% interest compounded monthly. How many years must you keep your money invested until it doubles? Okay, here's my equation. Remember, if you are not told how much money you start with, you get to make it up. I usually use 1,000 when this happens. But you could use any number you wanted. 1 plus... There's my rate, again, that needs to be in its decimal form. If you use 3.5, you're, you're going to be in trouble. Over, ooh, N. Number of times compounded in one year. Now, does that mean that N is going to be 1 every time? No. Yes. Yes. Whatever word is after compounded is the magic word that's going to tell you n. However many times this event happens in a year is your n value. And as was just mentioned, monthly happens 12 times in a year. So in both places where there's an n, I'm going to use 12. And they don't tell me what t is. They want me to figure that out. So here's my job. I'm going to plug this into the y equals. And in my case, since I used 1,000 for my first value, the question becomes, when's it going to be greater than 2,000? So let's pull the calculator up here. Oops, but I want to be in y equals. Make sure I'm typing everything in correctly. I will double check here as soon as I get it typed in. 1,000, 1 plus, divide. Yes. And I'm going to start rolling down the chart because notice it starts at 1,000. And I'm going to start rolling down that chart until I see a Y value get bigger than 2,000. Once I see the first one, I look to see what the x value is, and in this case, once we hit 2,000, it's at 20. And that's what I'll put. If you put 19 to 20 because it happens somewhere in the middle, that's fine too. But if you're only going to use one number, use the actual year that it goes over. Oh, back to our favorites. Unit 5. All right, what's the simplified form? Suggestion. 
If you see a negative exponent, fix it right away. How do we fix it? We flip it up to the numerator. And then we can get rid of that negative exponent so it doesn't mess with us. I don't see any pluses or minuses, so I'm just going to multiply across. Coefficients first. If you have like bases, we add the exponents. And now I'm going to simplify my final fraction here. 18 divided by 2 is 9. If we had a choice, we'd see it goes on top of our fraction here. There are no other x values, so I leave that alone. And then with my y's, again, when I'm dividing, bigger minus smaller, 5 minus 4 is 1. Wherever the bigger one is, that's where your answer goes. If you want to put it over 1 and leave it a fraction, you can. But that wouldn't be completely necessary. 14 factoring Orama multiplies to negative 14, adds up to negative 5. If that's still your Achilles heel at this point, you, you've got a few days left here to pound away at this stuff and get it down. Difference of squares. Write down what you square to get each piece. Notice I did not cancel anything at the start. Now is the point I can if things are identical. The x minus sevens are identical. These x's are bonded. They are not identical. That's as far as I can go. So those will hopefully be the things when there's multiple choice that you'll notice and go, oh yeah, I can't cancel the other stuff. It has to be these. Okay. Quotient. That sucker's got a flip. So the first fraction we leave alone. Second fraction, I'm going to do diamonds on both of them. So this is the one on top now. Multiplies to 42 and adds to 13 would be 7 and 6. Here, multiplies to 48 and adds to 14 would be 8 and 6. And now I start looking for those identical sets of parentheses. And whatever doesn't cancel out is going to be my answer. Just keep playing with these. Same thing here. Now, again, identify the LCD. It doesn't say solve, but I do see pluses and minuses, so I'm going to put my parentheses in. And so I run through my little checklist. Any coefficients in front? No. Any single variables that aren't locked up with plus or minus? No. So my LCD is just going to be the two sets of parentheses. It can be that easy sometimes. So just something to be aware of. Add in, now think about this too. When you're looking at something like this on a multiple choice part of an exam, a lot of times you're just gonna be able to, if you know how to find the LCD, you might be able to eliminate all the other answers. You might not even have to do the rest. So just something to consider. If you can factor your denominator, do it. Because then when you go to build fractions, you can go, okay, no coefficients, no single variables. So it's just the different sets of parentheses. Keep what you've already got. And remember, it's fraction builder mode. How do I get from the old one to the new one? If I've got everything, that's super. Then I don't have to do anything else. But if I don't have everything already, if I don't check off the pieces I have and there's things that aren't checked, that needs to get taken care of. And so I notice in that first fraction, there's nothing I have to really do. Here, if I distribute, 
I can just do a little side work there, never touching my denominator, but now I can just look at my like terms. 7x and 4x is 11x. 1 and 28 is 29. Does this factor? No. Nothing goes into 11 and 29. That's as far as I can go. Keep it simple, keep it simple, keep it simple. What are the excluded values? What makes my denominator equal zero? So again, this is all I care about. Take each part, set it equal to zero. Negative two would be a problem. Over here, at this point, I would think difference of squares is gonna be the easiest thing for a lot of you. So we've done so many of these the last week, shoot. Square two to get four. And set each of those equal to zero. I still could set it up like I did this, add the four and take the square root, but I just wanna make sure some of you don't forget about the plus minus part with that. And I kind of keep looking and I'm like, wow, unit five never ends. Parentheses when I don't see them. If it's just equals, if it's just a proportion, butterfly it, cross multiply it. Now we're back to algebra one, just that quick. Just to make sure we distribute. Minus the 4x over. We'll minus the 32 back. And again, as long as I'm careful with my algebra 1 skills, it really shouldn't take that long for me to be able to get that knocked out. And then the nice thing will be, if I don't match up with an answer, I know I did something wrong mathematically, so I'll be able to go back and pretty quickly check that. Okay, one more unit five, then we finally escape it. Solve, remember to check for extraneous solutions, okay. So I look and I go, hmm. Coefficients, okay, I got one, but one doesn't really do anything. I don't have any single variables. So here, my LCD, it's going to be x plus 4. So I go through and I go, okay. I look at this and just like we've done on the other ones, just like up on 17, I'm in fraction builder mode. Well, I got everything already. Okay, good. I don't have to do anything to that one. Ooh, here I don't, though. I got one, and I need to get to this. So I put that up top. And then finally, for the last one, I got everything. Difference with this one, though, is it's not just the plus. There's an equals there now, which means thank you, denominator, for your service, and you can go away now. So 2x plus 5x plus... 20 equals 3. I have like terms, so don't try to subtract the 2 from the 5. They're on the same side of the equals. Minus my 20 out. Don't freak out if you get a fraction for an answer. It, it really is okay. because I'll be able to tell you, when you're looking at the multiple choices on the test, it's not going to be a decimal. So a little math enter enter, if you go to decimal, that, that's quite all right. Little trig application here. If the tangent of A is seven over 24, adjacent, oops, opposite, oh my hearty, opposite over adjacent, I'll get this right yet. Because you're like, there's no numbers on the chart. Opposite over adjacent. Because again, remember, opposites across. 
hypotenuse is across from the right angle, which means me A over here. But here's my dilemma. What's the cosine? What's adjacent over hypotenuse? And again, your cheat sheet will have the Sokotoa on the top, so you don't have to worry about that. So cosine, I've got adjacent, which is 24. I don't have the hypotenuse. I've got to figure that part out. So this is where we go back to geometry for a minute. We go, okay, I remember how to do this. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Pull out our good old Pythagorean theorem. And then I'll let my calculator do the hard work. So 625, but that's not the answer. I got to take the square root of whatever answer I got. So since my H is 25, that is my denominator because it's adjacent over hypotenuse. So I got to do a little building there, but it's, it's not too bad. Last one on this page. Oh, more story problems. In a tourist bus near the base of the Eiffel Tower in Paris, a passenger estimates the angle of elevation to the top of the tower to be 50. Remember, I don't care if it says elevation depression. It goes at the bottom. If the height of the tower is 1,110 feet, what is the distance from the bus to the base, to the bottom of the tower? Got enough information to get this now. So I've got opposite. I do not have the hypotenuse. So I have opposite and adjacent, which is tangent of 50, is opposite over adjacent. Reminder, there's a pattern with these. I could do it algebraically, but I'm not going to here. The pattern tells me if x is on the bottom, we divide by the trig function. If x is on top, we multiply by it. So I get to here and I go, all right. Whoops, if I type it in right. So about 931 feet, which seems reasonable. If I'd have gotten like 10,000, probably not so reasonable. So not bad so far, not bad. Another application, 8.3 meter tall tree. All right. Cast, okay, 12.3 meter shadow. Shadows are on the ground. What's the angle of elevation? Opposite, adjacent. Dang, lots of tangenting. Here's the one to remember here though. If it's an angle, I've got to remember about that little negative one, which I do by hitting second with my trig function. Second tangent, there's my little negative one. So about 34 degrees. Not bad, not bad. Radians to degree. Radians to degree means we want the radians to go bye-bye, which means pi belongs in the bottom. Because that way, the pi's will just cancel. <coughs> I don't think this is going to come out <coughs> nice. And that's okay. Even if you said it was 129, you'll, you'll have a choice on the test that'll be obvious. If it says 129, you'd go with it. It's not like we're going to say one choice is 128.6 and everyone's 129. That'd be kind of silly. Find the period. Period has to do with my B, but that's not the answer. Period is 2 pi over B. <coughs> that would be what I'm looking for. Now, I can almost guarantee if this was a question on the test, Three will be one of the answers, so don't, don't get stuck with that. Find the amplitude, the value in front of my sine or cosine, but remember it's always positive. 
write a trig function that has a midline at 4. Don't make this hard. Put sine in there, put cosine in there, put an amplitude, put a, put a period change. I don't care, but this is as basic as you could go. If it said down, we'd put minus here instead. But you just got to put a plus or minus at the end, depending on what midline you're being asked for. Okay, displacement. Now, this seems so complex. Of a boat's water line above the sea levels that moves over the waves can be modeled by this, where x is the time. How many seconds elapse during one displacement cycle? What's B? That's all you're being asked. Whatever your B value is, that's the answer. Nothing to calculate. It's just an application asking you in a real fancy way to find B. It's all about the word cycle. Oh, we're almost there. What's the probability of rolling an odd number if you roll a six-sided die with sides numbered one through six? Okay. Successes would be odd numbers. One, three, and five. Three of them. How many total possibilities are there? One, two, three, four, five, six. And reduce my fraction. Happy, happy, happy. And to try and help out as we get to this last one, because I was a bonehead. Okay, use this chart to answer the next three questions, then I make you turn the page. That's not very nice. So, check us out. That's how we make technology work for us. Okay. Except for the fact that on the screen, if you're watching this somewhere, you can't see the values I have in here anymore. So I'm going to write them here to the side. And also to the fact that Hardy doesn't seem to know how to add. That's kind of funny. Not really. 49 plus 47 really is 96. And it is the other way too. So we'll, we'll get everybody set. All right, the possibility of finding a male and a junior. It just means it's the two together, male, junior, male, junior. There's 15. How many grand total people are there? 96. That's it. Nothing complex, nothing too hard to think about. But if I change one word in the middle, I change that and to or, now it's the probability of being a male 47 out of 96 plus being a junior 34 out of 96 but remember there can be overlap with ors are there any male juniors if there are there's 15 of them i have to take them back out or they'll get counted twice so let's see 81 minus 15 is 66 over 96 Always want to reduce my fractions and get my answer. One word, got to pay attention. Probability of male given they're a junior. Junior goes on the bottom, whatever's after given. Male junior goes on top. Male junior, 15 over all juniors, 34 just taking the information and using it the way you need it. And then finally here, now this is in a little different format, but it works. I see that it says or, so I'm going to take my A, 0. 0.6. I'm going to add my B, 0. 0.8. This, ladies and gentlemen, is our overlap. A and B, it has both. That's the part, just like up in number 31, that I have to take out. So, I have a feeling I just did something crazy, but I'm going to see. I did. That's so not right. Now, some of you are like, what? You, you did everything that you were supposed to. I, I did, except there was one thing I didn't do that I was supposed to. And that was pay attention to the fact that you can't, you can't get over one for probability. So getting 
give myself a duh on that one because that was just bad. Th this will not happen. If you saw an answer that came up over the one on the final, th that should raise red lights that you did something wrong. We did this right, but I must not have been thinking when I did this part. So that one is completely on me, but you would do it like you did number 31. And finally, researchers give one group a new cold medicine, compare them to a group that takes no medicine. What is the group that's not given any medicine? Okay, so what's the group called that takes the medicine? Okay, so we've got we've got our test group, and there's a few words that we could use for the group that's not given any medicine. They may be called the placebo. They may be called, why is my brain leaving me right now and what they're called? The, this is always great when I get into a video. I'm gonna come back to that word in a minute because it was in my brain and it just left it. I know how some of you feel on the quizzes now sometimes. We'll come back to that. It'll come back. Give an example of a study that is very different from the population, what is this called? Well, I can do this part. What is this called? Biased. Okay, an example of a study with a sample that's very different from the population. Oh, let's say we had a study. Mr. H studies students with A's to see if he's a good teacher. That, that, that's kind of ridiculous and self-serving here. It's definitely not what it would actually be when we're trying to um, uh, when we're trying to look at some of those things. And my brain, is still leaving me on this and nobody is bailing me out. I'm going to try and bail myself back out here. What's that? Thank you. Gosh, why did that word take away from me for so long? Control. Okay, Chris just saved me. Oh, dear. <laughs> now, if that was the only thing you forgot in the entire test, that, that wouldn't be a bad thing, but thank you. So that would cover everything you're going to see as far as the multiple choice goes, but again, you'll have choices. So thank you for surviving with me on a few of these things and wrap it up.